Could I give you all a very warm welcome to our service this morning as we gather together to worship God. There's a number of notices on the sheet that you'll have got when you came in. Please spend some time just going through it. A number of items that are coming up this week and also in the week, uh, weeks ahead. So just take your own time to, to go through it. I'll just highlight a couple of things just now. First of all, remember the after the morning service, there's tea and coffee served in the hall next door, and everyone's very welcome to stay behind for a time of fellowship there. Please do join us if you can. Uh, there's a note about all the different things going on through the week, just to highlight, particularly the Friday, the 55 plus fellowship. Uh, it's great, it's resuming again after its uh, break with COVID. And if anyone needs a lift uh, to that meeting, then you can con contact Duncan Norman. Uh, to arrange for lifts for that. There's numbers on the sheet there. The services next Lord's Day are the usual times. Just note the, the morning service, it will not be live streamed. We have Adam visiting with us in, um, the, during the morning service, so it will not be live streamed. Just bear that in mind. Uh, the rest of the notes is just read through uh, in your own time. Well, as we join together today to worship, we come together as a people and as a nation, very mindful of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on Thursday past. And we do remember her family at this time and her new king, King Charles III, as he takes up uh, that role. And we pray for God's comfort to them as a family and God's blessing on them as a family as they seek, uh, as they mourn her passing, as they seek the way forward. And our, our focus today is very much going to be on something that was precious to Her Majesty, and that is God's Word. And that's where we will turn today. We will hear about faith and what faith means and the blessing that we have through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as we come, before we begin our worship, we're going to observe a minute's silence. So if you're able to, please do stand, and we'll join together in a minute's silence. Now blessed be the Lord our God, the God of Israel, for he alone doth wondrous works in glory that excel. And blessed be his glorious name to all eternity. The whole earth let his glory fill. Amen. So let it be. Please be seated. As we come to worship God, we're going to begin by singing to his praise in Psalm 16. Uh, the Sing Psalms version. Our first two singings are from this psalm. Psalm 16 on page 16 of the psalm book from the beginning at verse 1. Protect me, O my God, you are my refuge true. I said you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. We'll sing from verse 1 to verse 6, the Tunis Selma, and we'll stand to sing.
join together now in a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice that we can approach your throne, that you are our God and our Lord, that there is a throne before whom every prayer we offer up is presented, and presented through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he reigns over us supreme, down through every generation and for all people, that we can look to you and put our trust in you. And at a tam time when there is much sorrow and sadness in our nation, and indeed in many nations of the world, we think of all that's going on around us, Lord. There are so many issues that will bring many tears to our eyes. We thank you that with you there is one who is able to wipe away every tear. So help us, Lord, that we will draw near to you in our time of worship, that you might bless us and keep us. And bless your word to us today as we will share from it. We do remember uh, the family of Her Majesty the Queen. We pray for our new king, King Charles. We pray for his brothers and sister. We pray for their children and grandchildren and all who mourn in the passing of the Queen in these times. We pray, O oh Lord, that as they come together as a family, just like we do at times of sorrow, that they would be given time to grieve and to mourn her passing. We know it can be so difficult in their situation, but we pray that you will comfort their hearts, that you will uphold them and strengthen them. We thank you for the Queen's reign over us and for how often she spoke of her King, her Saviour, Christ Jesus. And we pray that her faith will be reflected in her family, passed down to a generation to come, and that faith and your word will be at the forefront of all that is done in these days and for our nation and for the nations of the world, that the bedrock of our world would be Christ Jesus, our Lord. So may you bless us together as a people as we worship. We thank you for everyone here, for every home and family represented. Thank you for our young people, Lord. We pray your blessing on them. Uh, we pray for all that takes place in the Sunday school, the creche and the twinnies today. May you bless them all together. Look down upon us, Lord, and guide us in all we do, as we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just before the young ones go out, I'll just say a word to you. I'm sure you're very aware of what's happened in these past days when people have been very sad to hear of the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. And I'm sure you're very familiar with how she looked. And maybe you'll remember all kinds of different things about her. And everybody can remember maybe their own different memories about, about her. Some people would be very focused on maybe the clothes that she wore. She was often well turned out in different colored clothes, some of these very bright clothes. She often wore beautiful outfits. And people would often comment on that. Maybe you're familiar with the places that she lived, the places that she went. It wasn't just ordinary houses she lived in. She had Buckingham Palace. She had all kinds of places she used to live. She was in Windsor. She was in Balmoral. She was in all kinds of different places. She even had a, a yacht that she used to come even to Stornoway on to visit Stornoway. She used to come with her family here on her yacht. Maybe you're familiar with other things about her. Her voice. Her voice was very distinct. When you heard her voice, you knew it was her. And she would give speeches at different times and give maybe a message at Christmas time, each Christmas time. She delivered a message to the nation. There's another thing about her, though, that I want to think about just now, just for a wee minute, and that's the crown that she wore. Did you ever see her crown? It's a beautiful crown, and it's covered in diamonds and all kinds of jewels, very precious stones. And this crown is for whoever is king or queen over our land. And for the last 70 years, as she has ruled over our land, the crown has been hers, and she's worn it at different points, not often, but at different points during her life. And you wonder to yourself, I wonder what kind of, what's it like to wear that crown? She said herself at one point, it's really heavy. You have to be so careful when you're wearing it that you can't tilt your head forward just in case it falls off. It's really heavy. Maybe not the most comfortable thing to wear either, but it's a very precious thing. I wonder if anyone knows how much it's worth. If you would have a guess how much it's worth, what do you think? 
Is it thousands of pounds, hundreds of pounds, millions of pounds? Well, you keep going up and up and up. The, the royal family have their precious jewels, the crown jewels they're called. And they estimate that they're all together worth between three and five billion pounds. That's just an estimate. So the crown is very precious. And I wonder if you'll ever get to wear that crown yourself. It's very unlikely, isn't it? Nobody gets to wear it apart from the person who is queen or king of the land. So we'll maybe never get to wear it. But you know, there's another crown, and a crown that we receive through faith. And we've heard of so much about the queen and the faith that she had in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the promise to all who believe in the Lord Jesus is that they will receive a crown. It's speak, spoken about in the Bible in different places. One is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, where it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So there's a crown for all who believe in the Lord Jesus. So maybe one day you won't get to wear the crown of the queen or the king, but there's another crown that we can all share, and that's the crown of righteousness. By faith in the Lord Jesus, if we believe in him, the queen will receive her crown, and everyone with her will all be equal before God in his sight, and we'll all receive that same crown through faith. The queen often spoke about being a servant, and that's what we are to be. She had her own servants, but she spoke about being a servant. So who was she a servant to? She was a servant queen, as she said in a book, to the king who she serves. And who was that king? King Jesus, who she served. So may we all come to serve that same king, to love him with all our hearts, and to put our trust in him that we will all receive that crown of righteousness. But we're going to say the Lord's prayer together now. Let's say the Lord's prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we continue our singing in that psalm, Psalm 16, and we're going to sing from verse 7 down to the end of the psalm. I'll praise the Lord my God, whose counsel guides my choice, and even in the night my heart recalls instruction's voice. We'll sing from verse 7 to the end of the psalm to the tune Golden Hill, and we stand to sing. I'll praise the Lord, my God, whose counsel guides my joy, and even in the night my heart recalls instruction. 
Let us turn together to God's Word. We're going to read in the New Testament and Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, we're going to take up our reading at towards the end of chapter 2 and at verse 17, and then read on into chapter 3 and the whole of that chapter. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and at verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us, as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted that you, through your faith, about you through your faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? as we pray most earnestly, night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. And may God bless that reading from his word. We'll again engage in prayer. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, that it is a word that is never-ending. It will always stand and endure for all time and for all eternity. We thank you that it is a word that you have breathed out for us, that is inspired by you, that is unchangeable, and that is a truth there for us and for all people down through every generation and through all the different periods of time and all the different trials that people face individually, collectively, as nations and as a world. We thank you for the enduring strength of your word. We thank you that at times such as this for our nation, in the passing of Her Majesty the Queen, that your word is seen to the forefront so often. It may be a word that our nation has in many ways pushed, pushed away at different times, and especially maybe over these last number of years, there has been a great attack upon your word and upon the Christian faith. But we thank you that your word is still there for us, that it is spoken into our nation at this time, that your praise is heard sung, that great and eternal words such as that wonderful psalm, Psalm 23, where it speaks of the Lord, who is our shepherd. We thank you that a people have been heard singing that psalm, a people who maybe would normally not sing these words. And a nation has heard these words sung and will hear more sung and read in these coming days. And we pray for your spirit to be powerfully working in the midst of it. We know our nation has 
has seen so much change in this past week with the passing of the Queen, with a new Prime Minister inst installed, with a new King now in place. And our prayer is that the legacy of Her, Her Majesty the Queen will remain long with us, with our family and with our nation and indeed with the Commonwealth and the world. That the Saviour she spoke of so lovingly and so often, that these words will continue to bear much fruit. Uh, within our family we pray that they will remember her faith and all the other memories they have. We remember King Charles III as he takes up his reign as king. May you bless him from on high. May your spirit be with him. May the God that he has spoken of already become a God and a saviour to him in a very personal way. We pray, Lord, your blessing on his family and upon all the wider family at this time that you will console and comfort as only you can. We remember to our new Prime Minister, we pray for her, that you will also give her wisdom. The one who has sworn allegiance to a new king by the authority of God given and by your word. We pray for the word to become precious to her also, that our land, our nation, would once again return to be a people who put their trust in the word of God and in the Saviour who is Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we pray for your guiding hand upon us, that in the days that lie ahead, that your spirit will be poured out upon us, that you may bring days of peace and days of revival and days when your name will be pra praised and glorified in our midst. We know that there are many other things going on in our lives as well, and we do continue to remember our own needs locally, in our homes and in our families, Lord. We know that there are those who are grieving in this past week in our own midst, and in the week ahead, Lord, when there are funerals to take place as well. And we pray for you to draw near to our people, to surround them, to be with them in all the different needs. Guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, we pray. So that those who are unwell, those who are failing in health, those who are going through times of great difficulty at this time, those who are struggling, maybe even unseen to others, that they will be able to call upon your name as the one who is able to help. We pray, Lord, that we will remember one another and encourage one another. We pray for our land and our world at this time as well as we continue to hear of the conflict in the Ukraine and all that's going on, Lord, we do pray for days of peace to come. We pray for families and many people who have lost loved ones in this time of conflict. We know, Lord, that it seems so senseless in our eyes, and yet your word tells us that there's a purpose in all things. So help us to pray in faith, looking to you as the one who is able to do so much more than we ask or imagine. And Lord, we pray that you will give us faith in our own hearts, to go on in your strength. So we pray, Lord, your blessing on us to continue with us throughout this day. Lead us into your word. Lead us to see a Savior who is Christ the Lord. May we have him before us always, that you would direct us in the paths of life divine. We pray all these things, confessing our sin anew, how far short we fall, O Lord, in our hearts, in so many different ways, but we thank you that with you there is forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, have mercy upon us as a people and as a land, as a world and the nations of it. May you come in a day of your power. We ask it all for the glory of your name, for our Lord, our King, the one who is King of all and Lord of Lords. In the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. Before we turn back to our reading in 1 Thessalonians, we're going to sing to God's praise in Psalm 42. Again, so sing Psalms, version Psalm 42, and we'll sing verse 1 to verse 5. Psalm 42 at verse 1. As pants the deer for flowing streams, so longs my soul, O God, for you. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I meet with you anew, with God anew? We'll sing. From verse 1 to verse 5 in the Tunis Heron Gate, we stand and sing to God's praise. 
We'll turn back to our reading in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 3. We can read again at verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 at verse 5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you have that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you for this reason brothers in all our distress and affliction we have been comforted about you through your faith and so on. The last few days have been a momentous time for our nation, for the Commonwealth, and in many ways for the world in which we live. A huge change has taken place for us with the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in the midst of a week that had already seen a new Prime Minister installed. There's been a great change that's come upon us. And after 70 years reigning over the nation, There is a new king now, King Charles III. And all of these things, it will take time to get used to when there's something that's been a constant in your life for so long and a change takes place as often is the case. It takes a long time to get used 
to these kinds of change coming upon us. And any change will bring about questions. What will change in these days for us? What will stay the same? How are things going to be going forward? There will be change, no doubt, that comes along. There is always change in our midst. And when you look in God's Word, and particularly maybe if you look into the Old Testament, and you see in the Old Testament times when change came upon a nation, very often when maybe a king passed away, either in battle or through ill health, and a new king was installed, it was a time of great uncertainty for that nation. And a time when often the enemies surrounding them would seek to pounce on any weakness that may be found. It was a time when a nation whose king had changed would become very vulnerable to many different forms of attack. And for ourselves as a nation and as a people, this time of change can maybe feel a little bit uncertain too. We give thanks to God for the way the Queen ruled over our nation for all these years and for how often she spoke about a God who was very personal to her and the faith that she had and the influence and the calmness that this brought to her land. And the question may be now, what does the future hold? What does it mean for our nation and for our land? Are we going to see many changes? Well, today we look to the word of God, a word that was precious to her majesty and a word that we seek will be precious to ourselves. And what does it say to us? It talks about change in so many different ways. But then you have great verses that remind us that the word of God will always stand. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. God's word will always endure and will always stand. There has been much said and written about the queen since her passing. I'm sure you've been tuning in at different points and seeing so many different reports given about her. Two things have stood out for me in all I've heard about her in these past days. Two things have struck me. One was her servant spirit. And the second thing was her faith. We thank God that this faith has been spoken about. It was spoken about in Westminster by Tim Farron. He spoke about a personal faith that she had. And faith is such a precious thing. And a servant spirit is such a precious thing. Not just for a queen, but for every one of us. We can have that same servant spirit, prayerful spirit, seeking God's blessing and goodness over our land, over all of our leaders, that we would know his kingdom come in power. A book that the Queen allowed to be published by the Bible Society maybe sums it up with the title of the book. It said, and I quoted it earlier to the children, the servant queen and the king she serves. In her last Christmas speech last year, she spoke of Jesus and said this, the one whose teachings have been handed down from generation to generation and have been the bedrock of my faith. In this time of change, our prayer is that this generation and generations to come will still have the word of God as a bedrock of faith, that our nation, our land, and our people, that we will be built upon the rock that is Jesus Christ, that our nation would enjoy much blessing from God. And as we turn to God's word and this letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, we are reminded here of the precious nature of faith, of what it means. And it's a, a, a reminder to us that no matter who we are, whether we're royalty, a prime minister, or just common people such as we are, that all of us can have faith in a king, in a king who wore a crown for his people, not of jewels of gold or silver or diamonds, but a crown of thorns, 
that was pressed down on his head as he bled and died for the sins of this world. It was to that king that she looked and served. And it's to that king and faith in him that the word of God points us to this day, to this day today, as we turn to his word. So we want us to be encouraged, not just in the faith of the queen. She wouldn't want a sermon just about her. She would want a sermon about her king, the Lord Jesus, and for us to come and have faith in him. So this letter to the Thessalonians, it's a real letter of encouragement, a real letter of a, to a church that was blessed through God's word, but a place and a people who faced many different challenges, and not least the challenge to their faith. And Paul longs to hear about them, how they are going on, what is happening in their life, and to encourage them to go on in their faith. You read in, in the earlier chapter, in, in chapter 2 and at verse 13, that they had received the word of God gladly. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a word of men, but as it, what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. There was this word that was at work in this place. And it's this word that we look to work in this place here, in our congregation, in our town, and far and wide, that God's word would work in our midst, be heard and received gladly by many. But Paul and his fellow servants, Silvanus and Timothy, they had been challenged in many ways, and they'd been forced to flee from the people of Thessalonica. But as they had been torn away from them, as it says in verse 17 of chapter 2, they were still concerned for them to hear of their faith and how things were going. And in some ways, we, we think of the queen and how she would address the nation and how King Charles III addressed the nation uh, just yesterday. And these addresses, they go far and wide to all people. Well, here Paul is writing to a people far and wide, not just for his time, but for every generation, that people would come and hear of this word that is powerful, this word that is able to save, and this Savior who is able to save, the Lord Jesus Christ. And their focus here is to address these people, and I say as address ourselves today as well, the great question, the great concern that they have about them is not just how they are going on. What's their great concern? Their great concern is, how is your faith? As you read through even these verses in chapter 3, how often do you see the word faith mentioned? Verse 2, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 10. They all mention this word faith. And Paul is asking them, how is your faith? How is your faith growing? Is your faith being challenged? And they're openly talking about the subject, faith. How is your faith? The queen spoke of her faith often. How often do we speak of our faith? How often do we encourage one another in our faith? How often do we ask one another, how is your faith. Well, Paul here is addressing that very question. He's asking the question, how is your faith today? And when we think about that for ourselves, we have to just ponder that question. How is our faith? Are we feeling downcast? Are we feeling dismayed? Are we feeling discouraged? What can encourage us in the midst of these times. Well, Psalm 42 gives us that great instruction. Its instruction is to come to God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I meet with you anew, the psalmist says. My tears have been my constant food, both in the night and in the day, while all day long insistently, where is this God of yours, they say. The people around us are saying, what is your faith going to do for you now? Where is your faith? 
Well, the psalmist gives response to that when he says in verse 5, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you so disturbed in me? Trust God, for I will praise him yet. My Savior and my God is he. There is faith in these words. And that is the faith that Paul longs for his people to have. And he has this great desire as he writes to them to know how their faith is. In verse 5, he says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, he was longing to hear how their faith was, and he could bear it no longer. He wanted to know, so he sent to learn about your faith. He sent to learn about how their faith was. He had this longing to know how their faith was. Imagine that this is a time of year when Many people will have children going away to college and university, going away from home for the first time. But imagine your child is gone and you haven't heard from them for a few days. You're going to be wondering, what's going on? Why haven't they phoned? Why haven't they been in touch? Your concern is only going to increase the more the days go by. And you're worried and you're longing to hear what's happening. Well, this is the way Paul has this concern too. He's been torn away from the people of Thessalonica, but his concern is to hear, how are they? And this is God's concern for his people today as well. God is speaking through Paul, not just to the church of Thessalonica, but through every generation of people. And he's asking and longing to hear about our faith. How is your faith today. Sometimes we can have a general concern for people, and that's right. How are they keeping in their health? How are they keeping in the home? How are things going in the workplace? We have all these kinds of concern for people, but do we ask one another about our faith? How is your faith today? How is your relationship with the Lord today? Are you Coming close to God, are you drifting away from God? Paul's longing here is to know how their faith is. And our concern for one another should be that too. How is your faith? How is your relationship with the Lord? God is a God who has communicated through his word from generation to generation. And this communication demands a response. This communication as he speaks to us day after day, week after week, it's not just a one-way communication. God is speaking to us that we might respond to him. God is speaking to our nation just now. He is communicating to us in so many different ways. He has spoken to us in very powerful ways. The things that have changed in our midst, the things that have changed, even in these last few days, things that have been bedrock and foundation to our land. God is shaking us, but he's communicating to us through his word and still saying to us that he is the God who reigns. Even when change comes to our nation, he is still God who reigns supreme. We have a king who is Jesus. Jesus was the great one who spoke to his people and challenged them about faith so often. For example, when Jesus was speaking in Matthew chapter 22, the Pharisees had gathered together and Jesus asked them the question, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. Jesus would often challenge people about their faith. Again, In Luke 9, 9, verse 18, he said, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah and others, one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ, the Son of God. God's word convicts a people doesn't matter who we are, royalty or common people, God's word convicts. And it is to this word we are to come and find the bedrock, the solid ground, the cornerstone, 
that is Christ Jesus. Paul is concerned here that the people regarding their faith, that they would go on learning, that they would stand strong in the midst of affliction, that they wouldn't be tempted away by Satan. That's what you see in verse 2 through to verse 5. These were the very real challenges that were going on around them. He speaks there in verse 5, for example, to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. There are all these real challenges that go on around us to this day. But our faith is to remain in Christ Jesus, to stand strong in him. So the question was, how is your faith? That was Paul's great concern for Thessalonica. That's God's great concern for his people today. How is your faith? Don't let your faith be shaken when change comes. Remain strong. Stand steadfast with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there were all these challenges, but look at how Paul hears back then from Timothy's report in verse 6. He's taken action to hear. He could bear it no longer to hear about their faith. So he sent Timothy. And then in verse 6, we read these words. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love. There has been good news heard about their faith and love. The time between Paul sending Timothy and hearing back, you can sense that change in the words that he writes there in verse 5 and then verse 6. He could bear it no longer in verse 5, but then in verse 6, but now that Timothy has come, to us from you, he has brought good news about your faith. There is great joy as they hear about the faith of the people. And wouldn't it bring us great joy today to see our nation and its rulers turn to God in faith, to be led by a new king who proclaims a faith in Christ Jesus, to be led by a new prime minister who would profess a faith in Christ Jesus, to be led by a first minister who would pledge her faith to God and to Christ Jesus as her Lord, not just with platitudes and words, but with a sincere heart and a reverence and a fear of the Lord. Wouldn't that give us the same great delight? The news that Timothy has brought from Thessalonica is good news of your faith and your love. May our prayer be that for our king, our prime minister, all of our land, that there be good news of faith and love. There was real worry in what might happen in Thessalonica, and there's real worry what might happen in our land. But may we hear good news. You know, this isn't just a, a school report that's coming back through Timothy. When you get school reports for your children, I can't remember the last time I think I, we had a negative one. Because I think teachers will always find something positive to write in a school report. No matter what it is, there'll always be something positive that can be said. Sometimes we just have to be told we're not good. And God's word does that so clearly for us. We're reminded that we are all sinners. And fall short of the glory of God. But then there can be good found too. There can be good found when we see a Savior who is Christ. When we see how precious he is. When we come to put our trust in him. That is good news. And we are thankful that we hear good news. Good news that God is working throughout the world, that God is calling a people to himself. We hear bad news so often. It's there for us every day. But God brings good news. Good news that there is one who is able to save. Good news that Her Majesty the Queen would often remind our nation of in her Christmas address. No matter how bad the year had been, and she often spoke of Many different challenges that they faced. As a family, they are families just like ourselves. 
They had their crises as we have our crises. They had their tragedies as we have our tragedies. No one is immune from them. And yet in the midst of it all, she could still speak of a saviour. A saviour who had given strength. A saviour who had given help. A saviour who was there in many different times of need. And that is the saviour that Christ, who is Christ. That is the saviour who Paul is encouraging the people here in Thessalonica, Thessalonica to go on in, in his strength. And that is the saviour that we are being encouraged as a people to put our trust in. There's a great delight in hearing good news. And what effect does this good news have? Well, when you look at verse 8, it says, For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. As they are standing fast in the Lord, they go on in strength. And that is what we need too to go forward. To go forward standing fast in the Lord. Seeking his face. Seeking his goodness upon us. Rich and poor. Royalty and common people. What can unite us together? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Martin Luther once said, God our Father has made all things depend on faith so that whoever has faith will have everything and whoever does not have faith will have nothing. No matter how much more value we maybe think the Queen had than us, without faith she was nothing just as we are. But with faith, she had everything, just as we can. Faith is what we need. And the third thing and final thing we see here is, is as we go forward in faith, it gives us a real sense of focus and devotion. Given the outcome, the response here is prayer and thanksgiving. They were delighted to hear that the people were going on in faith. And God seeks for his people to go on in faith. And in verse 9 it says, For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before God as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what was lacking in your faith. They long to come and encourage them in their faith. And this is a great reminder to ourselves of the devotion that we should have to our Savior, that we should seek to be a servant people to a king we serve. And may we come to have this prayerful devotion for one another, for our land and for all its people and for all who rule over us, that we will go forward united in faith, united and strengthened by God. As verse 11 says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. What kind of prayer is this? It's an earnest prayer. And today our prayers are to be earnest, pleading with God. Direct us in your paths. Show us your ways that we may delight in them. Guide all our steps that they may be steps of faith and love for God, our Savior, and God who has blessed us. May our plea be earnest for our new King, for our new Prime Minister, for our land and for the nations of the world. We need healing. We need help. And he is the one who can provide it. We need all of these things. We need to plead with God. It is also a persistent prayer. Night and day, it says in verse 10, as we pray most earnestly, night and day, there is a real sense of pleading and persistent prayer here. May we go on praying persistently, asking God night and day to pour out his blessing on us, 
night and day to give blessing to our land, to give renewal to our land. It's a specific prayer as well. We can be specific in our prayers too. Paul was saying, we pray that we may see you face to face and that you supply what, to supply what is lacking in your faith. May our prayers be specific as well. Asking God to bring a people of faith to lead us well and to keep on praying. We are commanded to pray for those who rule over us in God's word. May we take that prayer seriously. No matter what our differences of opinions may be, may prayer unite us to ask God to bless and to guide our nation in the days ahead, that he would bear much fruit in our land. John Newton was a great preacher in his day. John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, and he preached well past his retirement age, as I said. And very often as he was preaching towards the end of his, uh, his days, he would have an assistant standing beside him in the pulpit who would support him uh, as he was feeling weak. He was nearly blind and he spoke in whispers, but nothing would keep him from preaching. And one Sunday while he was delivering a message, a sermon, he repeated the phrase, Jesus Christ is precious. And his assistant beside him just whispered to him, you've already said that twice. John Newton turned to his helper and said, yes, I've said it twice and I'm going to say it again. And he lifted up his voice and he shouted at the top of his voice, Jesus Christ is precious. That is what he wanted his people to know. Jesus Christ is precious. How is your faith today? Speaking on the 3rd of August this year, just over a month ago, Her Majesty the Queen said this, throughout my life, the message and teachings of Christ have been my guide and in them I find hope. She was a queen, but more than that, she was a servant, a servant to her king. Jesus Christ was precious to her. We pray her new king will rule well and wisely with that same servant spirit. But above all, we pray that Jesus Christ will be precious to him. We pray that for our new prime minister, that Jesus Christ will be precious to her. Let us remember too, kings and queens and prime ministers come and go. That crown of the queen and king may be passed on to others. But there's a greater crown for all who put their trust in Christ Jesus as a precious Savior, the crown of righteousness, awarded not just to royalty, but to all of Christ's servants who put their trust in him. How is your faith? Is your faith in Jesus Christ, who is precious? May we find in him the one who is our Savior and our God and find our hope in him. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice in our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is head over all. We thank you that we worship a living Savior, one who came and bore the crown on the cross for us, that crown of thorns so that we might receive a crown of righteousness. We thank you for his sacrifice, for his service. We thank you, Lord, that he gave all for us. We pray that no matter our position, 
whether it's the royalty and rulers of this world or ourselves as a common people, that we would find our hearts serving our King and our Lord and putting our trust in him for now and for eternity. May you bless your word in this day and in the days ahead, that it will be a word that reverberates around our land, a word that bears much fruit for your glory. May you continue to comfort and to bless all who need you in different ways as we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to conclude by singing to God's praise in Psalm 117 in the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 117, page 397 of the Psalm books. O give ye praise unto the Lord, all nations that be, likewise ye people, all accord his name to magnify. For great to us, wherever are his loving kindnesses, his truth endures for evermore. The Lord, O oh, do ye bless. We'll sing this psalm to God's praise and we stand to sing. After the benediction, I'll go to the door to my left and we'll close with the benediction. Now may grace, mercy, and peace from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>